the 1st of September, 1939. Nazi Germany invades Poland, and the German army is followed by the Einsatzgruppen, which are Nazi mobile death squads, sent to Poland to kill the civilians, mostly the Polish intelligentsia, such as teachers, priests, physicians, and other prominent members of Polish society. After the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, these paramilitary death squads will conduct mass shooting operations, targeting mostly Jews, Romani, Soviet officials, and other people with disabilities. From 1941 to 1945, while operating behind the front line in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe, the Einsatzgruppen will murder around two million innocent men, women, and children, accounting for one-third of all Jewish Holocaust victims. The murders will take place with the knowledge and support of the German army, which will not only cooperate with the Einsatzgruppen, providing logistical support for their operations, but also participate in the mass killings. One of the army's most important supporters of these mass shooting operations is a German field marshal, Walter von Reichenau. Walter Karl Ernst August von Reichenau was born on the 8th of October, 1884, in Karlsruhe, then part of the German Empire, as a son of a Prussian lieutenant general. Walter himself joined the Prussian army as an artillery officer cadet on the 14th of March, 1903, and then attended the Prussian War Academy. The First World War began on the 28th of July, 1914. At the beginning of the war, Reichenau served as an adjutant of the 1st Guards Field Artillery Regiment before being transferred to the German General Staff. In 1915, he served as the 2nd Staff Officer of the 47th Reserve Division and then as the 1st Staff Officer of the 7th Cavalry Division. For gallantry in action, he was awarded the Iron Cross 2nd and 1st Class. However, Reichenau was not only progressively minded, but also brutal. He ordered soldiers, if absent from their post without a valid pass, liberty or leave, to be executed, even in times of peace. The First World War ended on the 11th of November, 1918, when the German leader signed the armistice in the Compiègne Forest in France. In April 1919, he married the Silesian aristocrat, Countess Alexandrina zu Wartenberg und Penzlin. In the new Weimar Republic, which was the government of Germany from 1918 to 1933, Walter von Reichenau was a general staff officer with the paramilitary Freikorps units. In the aftermath of World War I and during the German Revolution of 1918 to 1919, Freikorps, consisting largely of World War I veterans, were raised as paramilitary militias. They were ostensibly mustered to fight on behalf of the government against the communists attempting to overthrow the Weimar Republic. Freikorps acted with particular brutality and violence, and many of the units proved to be rebellious and difficult for the German government and military to control. In 1919, Reichenau joined the newly established Reichswehr, the German army, of the Weimar Republic. Reichenau was chosen as one of only 4,000 officers to serve the Reichswehr, which the Treaty of Versailles had limited to 100,000 men. He also took a post in the Truppenamt, an agency which concealed the existence of the prescribed German army general staff. In April 1932, Reichenau's uncle, a diplomat and an ardent Nazi, introduced him to Adolf Hitler. Reichenau joined the Nazi party, although doing so was a violation of the army regulations. Reichenau himself was an anti-Semite, who equated Jewry with Bolshevism and a perceived Asian threat to Europe. Extremely ambitious, he saw the Nazi party as a revolutionary vessel in which he could propel his career, and so broke with the pro-monarchist politics of the Prussian military caste and became a devoted Nazi. As an outspoken ally and advocate of Hitler and the Nazi party, Reichenau soon ran afoul of cabinet member and eventual chancellor, Kurt von Schleicher, who used his authority to have him transferred out of his prestigious posting in Berlin to the headquarters of the military district of East Prussia, a relative backwater. But for this, von Schleicher would later pay the ultimate price. In East Prussia, Reichenau served under General Werner von Blomberg, a fellow exile of Schleicher's. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party came into power in January 1933. In new Nazi Germany, Blomberg became Minister of War and Walter von Reichenau was promoted to head the powerful ministerial office, acting as the liaison officer between the army and the Nazi party. It was not until February 1934 that Reichenau came into conflict with Ernst Röhm, chief of staff of the paramilitary SA, who from the summer of 1933 was already demanding that the SA have mobilization and warfare competencies and intended to subordinate the Reichswehr to the SA structures. 
This seemed to threaten the monopoly position of the Reichswehr as the nation's only arms bearer. Therefore, on the 27th of June, 1934, Reichenau, together with Blomberg, urged Hitler to take action. The SA had to be disempowered, as did the conservative elites around the Vice-Chancellor Franz von Papen, who was still standing in the way of the Nazis completely seizing power. He claimed that the power of Ernst Röhm and the SA must be broken if the army was to support the Nazi-led government. Along with Hermann Göring and Heinrich Himmler, Reichenau belonged to the terrible triumvirate that decided who would or would not die. The murders took place between the 30th of June and the 2nd of July, 1934. And the SS also murdered several conservative critics of the Nazi regime, including Hitler's predecessor as Chancellor and Reichenau's political enemy, General Kurt von Schleicher. These assassinations later became known as the Röhm's Affair, or the Night of the Long Knives. At Hitler's request, the German parliament declared the killings legal, after the fact based on false accusation that Röhm and his commanders had planned to overthrow the government. This purge demonstrated the Nazi regime's willingness to go outside of the law to commit murder as an act of state for the perceived survival of the nation. On the 1st of August 1934, one day before President Hindenburg's death, Hitler's cabinet passed the Law Concerning the High State Office of the Reich, which stipulated that upon Hindenburg's death, the office of the president, head of state, would be abolished and its powers merged with the chancellor, head of government, under the title of Führer. On the 2nd of August, 1934, two hours after Hindenburg's death, Hitler proclaimed himself the Führer of Germany and claimed absolute power. In 1935, Reichenau was promoted to Lieutenant General and was also appointed to command the military forces in Munich. Until the First World War, von Reichenau was an athlete, and he later played tennis and went skiing. He was also an athletics coach and even organized a football championship. In 1936, he participated in the organization of the Olympic Games in Berlin. For two weeks in August 1936, Adolf Hitler's Nazi dictatorship camouflaged its racist militaristic character while hosting the Summer Olympics. Minimizing its anti-Semitic agenda and plans for territorial expansion, the regime exploited the games to impress many foreign spectators and journalists with an image of a peaceful and tolerant Germany. Having rejected a proposed boycott of the 1936 Olympics, the United States and other Western democracies missed the opportunity to take a stand that contemporary observers claimed might have restrained Hitler and bolstered international resistance to Nazi tyranny. After the Olympics, Germany's expansionism and the persecution of Jews and other deemed enemies of the state accelerated, culminating in World War II and the Holocaust. However, for von Reichenau, sport was only a means to an end, not the actual goal. This goal was the preparation of military training with popular sports, because as he said, a good sportsman is a good soldier. He attached particular importance to team sports, since they would promote the subordination of the individual will to the overall will. His ideal was a leveling of class differences through sport, but even as a sports general as he was called, he was unable to implement his ideas in the Wehrmacht. In May 1939, Reichenau commanded the German 10th Army, with which he took part in the invasion of Poland, which began on the 1st of September, 1939, and marked the beginning of the Second World War. The campaign in Poland ended on the 6th of October the same year, with Germany and the Soviet Union dividing and annexing the whole of the country. After the victory over Poland, the German 10th Army was renamed the 6th Army. Nazi Germany possessed overwhelming military superiority over Poland. Germany launched the unprovoked attack with an advance force consisting of more than 2,000 tanks, supported by nearly 900 bombers and over 400 fighter planes. In all, Germany deployed 60 divisions and nearly 1.5 million men in the invasion. The Panzer tank divisions were vital to the German army's early success. In the strategies of Blitzkrieg, the Wehrmacht combined the mobility of light tanks with airborne assault to quickly progress through weak enemy lines, which enabled the German army to take over Poland and later France. These tanks were used to break through enemy lines, isolating regiments from the main force so that the infantry behind the tanks could quickly kill or capture the enemy troops. After the campaign, Walter von Reichenau was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his role as commander of the 10th Army. The German invasion of France, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands started on the 10th of May, 1940, and became known as the Battle of France. These countries, along with France, were conquered within six weeks. During the invasion of the Low Countries, the Sixth Army saw active service linking up with paratroopers and destroying fortifications during the Battle of Belgium. 
The Sixth Army was then involved in the breakthrough of the Paris defences on the 12th of June, 1940, before acting as a northern flank for German forces along the Normandy coast during the closing stages of the Battle of France. In the great wave of promotions that followed the fall of France in June 1940, Reichenau was promoted to Field Marshal in August of the same year. Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, began on Sunday, the 22nd of June, 1941. During the invasion, as commander of the 6th Army, Reichenau led his army into the heart of Russia during the summer of 1941. The 6th Army was a part of Army Group South and captured Kiev, Bolgorod, Kharkov, and Kursk. During its offensive into the Soviet Union, the German army was confronted with a number of superior tank designs. Reichenau inspected the Soviet tanks he came across, entering each tank and measuring its armor plating. After examining a T-34, Reichenau told his officers, if the Russians ever produce it on an assembly line, we will have lost the war. After initial great successes by the German troops, the advance came to a standstill in October and November 1941 due to the onset of the muddy period. Hitler tried to conquer Leningrad, which failed, and the following siege lasted 872 days, from the 8th of September 1941 until the 27th of January 1944. The blockade became one of the longest and most destructive sieges in history, and it was possibly the costliest siege of all time due to the number of casualties which were suffered throughout its duration. As a result, the Wehrmacht lacked the strength to take Moscow, and a protracted war was imminent. Von Reichenau, while in command of the 6th Army, had issued the notorious Severity Order, also called the Reichenau Order, which supported Nazi genocidal policies and advocated for punishment against the so-called subhuman species of Jews and the extermination of Jewish Bolshevism in Europe. The order said, The most important objective of this campaign against the Jewish Bolshevik system is the complete destruction of its sources of power and the extermination of the Asiatic influence in European civilization. In this Eastern theater, the soldier is not only a man fighting in accordance with the rules of the art of war, but also the ruthless standard bearer of a national conception and the avenger of bestialities which have been inflicted upon German and racially related nations. For this reason, the soldier must learn fully to appreciate the necessity for the severe but just retribution that must be meted out on the subhuman species of the Jews. It has the further purpose of nipping in the bud uprisings in the Wehrmacht's rear, which experiences had taught were always instigated by Jews. The order paved the way for mass murder of Jews and encouraged German soldiers to murder Jewish civilians on the Eastern Front. All Jews were henceforth to be treated as partisans, and commanders were directed that they be either summarily shot or handed over to the Einsatzgruppen execution squads. Women and children were to be shot as well, in order to not have any Avengers remain. As commander of the 6th Army, Reichenau bore co-responsibility for the massacres in his area. On the 10th or 11th of August, 1941, Friedrich Jekon, the higher SS and police leader of southern Russia, ordered Paul Blobel, commanding officer of the Zonderkommando 4A, to exterminate the entire Jewish population of Bilet Zerkva, Soviet Ukraine, on behalf of Adolf Hitler. On the 22nd of August, 1941, with the consent of Field Marshal Walter von Reichenau, Blobel Sonderkommando 4A of Einsatzgruppe C and Ukrainian auxiliary policemen murdered between 4,000 and 5,000 Jews. When Wehrmacht chaplains tried to prevent the killing of 90 Jewish children who were left behind in an abandoned building, Reichenau ordered that the children were also to be shot. The 90 children were executed separately a few days later. Many children were hit four or five times before they died. The heart-wrenching wailing made by the children as they died was indescribable. Due to the close contacts between Paul Blobel and Walter von Reichenau, there was also close cooperation between the Wehrmacht and the Sonderkommando in the largest massacre in the occupied Soviet Union during World War II. On the 19th of September, 1941, German forces entered the city of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Along with a large part of German-occupied Ukraine, the city was incorporated into the Reich Commissariat Ukraine, which had been established on the 1st of September with Erich Koch as administrator. Before the German invasion, some 160,000 Jews resided in Kiev, which was approximately 20% of the total population of the city. Following the start of Operation Barbarossa in June 1941, approximately 100,000 Jews fled the capital or were already serving in the Soviet military. By the time the Germans occupied Kiev, there were about 60,000 Jews remaining in the city. Most of those who remained were women, children, the elderly, 
those who were ill, or those who had been unable or unwilling to flee earlier. During the first week of the German occupation of Kiev, there were two major explosions. These explosions not only destroyed the German headquarters and areas around the main street of the city center, but also killed a large number of German soldiers and officials. Though the explosions were caused by mines left by retreating Soviet soldiers and officials, the Germans used the sabotage as a pretext to murder those Jews who still remained in the city. On the 29th and 30th of September, 1941, SS and German police units and their auxiliaries, under the guidance of the members of Einsatzgruppe C, murdered a significant number of the Jewish population who remained in Kiev. This massacre, which belongs to one of the many mass shootings perpetrated by the Nazi Germans beginning in 1941, occurred at a ravine called Babi Yar or Babinyar, which at the time was located just outside the city. On the 28th of September, the Jews were ordered to assemble the next morning for resettlement. Although only a participation of approximately 5 to 6,000 Jews had been expected at first, more than 30,000 Jews arrived, who until the very moment of their execution still believed that they were going to be resettled, thanks to extremely clever organization. They were made to march to the ravine. As they reached the site, they were forced to surrender any valuables. They were then made to take off their clothes and move towards the edge of the ravine in groups of 10. As they reached the edge, they were shot by Blobel Zondo Commando 4A. German and Ukrainian police participated in the killing as well. At the end of the day, the bodies were covered with a thin layer of dirt. According to reports sent to the Einsatzgruppe headquarters in Berlin, 33,771 Jews were massacred during this two-day period, and it was one of the largest mass killings at a single location during World War II. At least 29 survivors are known. One of them is Dina Pronicheva, who was one of those ordered to march to the ravine, to be forced to undress, and then to be shot. In one of her written post-war testimonies, Pronicheva described what she saw at Babi Yar. Each time I saw a new group of men, women, elderly people and children being forced to take off their clothes, all of them were being taken to an open pit where submachine gunners shot them. Then another group was brought. With my own eyes, I saw this horror. Although I was not standing close to the pit, terrible cries of panic-stricken people and quiet children's voices calling mother, mother, reached me. Jumping before being shot and falling on other bodies, Pronicheva survived by playing dead in a pile of corpses. However, the killings at Babi Yar continued. Over the next few months, thousands more were murdered there, including Jews, gypsies, and Soviet prisoners of war. Those who attempted to hide were turned over to the Germans by the Ukrainians. In all, some 100,000 people, Jews and non-Jews, were killed at Babi Yar. Reichenau's troops also assisted with the other crimes against humanity that occurred in areas under his command. The only objection that Walter von Reichenau raised to the activities of the Einsatzgruppen in his sector was when they were killing so many Jews so quickly that they began to create ammunition shortages in his sector of operations. This issue he addressed by recommending that the SS and SD limit themselves to two bullets per Jew. In November 1941, Hitler relieved Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt from his command of Army Group South and promoted Reichenau, who was in his position responsible for killing tens of thousands of innocent men, women and children, to take his place. At his personal recommendation to Hitler, Friedrich Paulus, a protégé of Reichenau's and a former member of his command staff, was promoted to take over his command of the 6th Army. However, Reichenau would not enjoy this new position for long. On the 15th of January, 1942, in temperatures well below minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, Reichenau went on his usual six-mile cross-country run. Shortly after he returned, he collapsed with a severe stroke. When Hitler heard the news, he ordered that Reichenau be flown back to Germany for treatment. However, the flight carrying him back to Leipzig for medical attention crashed on landing in Lviv, and Reichenau sustained severe head injuries. Whether he died from his stroke or from injury sustained in the crash is unknown. But on arrival in Leipzig on the evening of the 17th of January, 1942, Reichenau was proclaimed dead. He was 57 years old. Walter von Reichenau was then given a state funeral and was buried in the Invalid Cemetery, the traditional resting place of the Prussian army in Berlin. In 1944, his descendants received a grant of real estate worth approximately 1 million Reichsmarks. Having died in 1942, Reichenau was never convicted of war crimes and could not face justice during the Nuremberg Trials, which were held after the Second World War, 
and sentenced representatives of the defeated Nazi Germany, including Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel and Colonel General Alfred Jodl, to death by hanging. There were no tears shed for Walter von Reichenau. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Please help us to create more videos by clicking on the donation link. Thank you, and see you next time on the channel.